At first sight, blue-eyed and all smiles from the day A.E. was born into this world, it seemed like the one thing everyone knew, especially Mom and Dad. She can do no wrong. Me, I was the other daughter, received whatever road, second-hand ideas and second-hand clothes. See, Ava deserves the best, my mom would explain as she waded through heaps of carefully wrapped new toys for her and in result handed me something used, like socks or a beat-up old book. No, but not only for the presents. It was everything. Ava got the new outfit, the new toys and everyone's eyes. Ava, sweet Ava, grew up knowing everyone worshipped the ground she walked on. And why wouldn't she? She was treated like royalty. It will make you another person. She quickly learned how to manipulate our world around us, if that meant walking all over me. Then so be it. She did stunts, pranks that got me in trouble instead of her, such as when she ruined Dad's favorite watch and put it in my drawer. Needles to say, guess who got grounded for a month. She was slick, too. Has every big chap in the family eating out of her palms, the thought was always that, there goes Donna. She is so sweet and here comes this troublemaker, my bad seed. They whispered as if I could not hear them. Elise is all just hard. But I did, every word. Elise, why aren't you more like your sister? Mom often chimed. She never hesitated, even when remarking about how hearing it will make me think of Ava instead of floating around the same as she owned this place. I tend to recall a certain afternoon. Odd, like the time he did it back in Waco, that spring evening, we were both sitting around his living room reading from scripts or whatever message faxes to Billy Graham we had decided meant something. Ava frolicked by modeling a new dress Mom had purchased for her, one of those you glimpse in shop windows. And I looked at my own clothes, washed too many times and faded by the sun, an envy felt in that soft press behind your eyes. Isn't she just adorable? Mom sounded all sweet when she clapped her hands with one of those cheerful sighs. Dad sat on the couch, his focus split between reading from a newspaper and Ava. Elise, could you get your sister's bala shoes? I asked Mom, not taking my eyes off Ava. She has her dress rehearsal soon, and you know how important that is. I nodded, made my way to Sarah's even larger bedroom that was crammed with the toys and gadgets I could only hope for. As I searched through all her stuff trying to find the shoes I thought, why here? Why not me? Here, I threw the shoes at Ava a little more harshly than intended. I returned to find Sophie sitting on the floor with her big blue eyes wide open, fiending shocked innocence. Elise, don't be rough. Say you're sorry to your sister. Dad bellowed from behind his newspaper. Ava, sorry, I mumbled my face growing hot. The only one who ever understood, who really knew what was happening was Grandma, Dad's mom. She was no fool and would not take bullshit from anyone. Tom, she would admonish my father, and while her voice was humanly firm, it carried a hint of reproof as well. You're not thinking that your daughters are getting the same kind of care. Elise is just as deserving of that love and attention. Dad would brush it off, and Mom always has the same kind of look on her face that rolls eyes at Grandma like she is playing for attention. Mom always argued, we have a rough with everyone, but her sentiments fizzed in the thick atmosphere like all those things they had given Eva and none for me. Grandma would put her hands on my own and pull me aside after these talks, gripping them with a force that betrayed the fragility of their skin. Listen, Elise, you have to be strong, so never let them darken your shine, because you are just as smart and deserve all the same opportunities that your sister gets, she would say to me with a fierce determination on her face. It worked for me most days. The day of graduation was supposed to be a high point, the culmination year's worth of hard work, it was just one more in the long line of final straws for any parental support. Dude, they straight up were not going to pay for me go to college. It's just he's hardly a safe bet. Dad shrugged again reading my future like someone plays the stock market. And this is when Grandma stepped in. 
St. Leo's was a refuge for me, and her offer to pay my tuition at the school wasn't just financial. It saved me from drowning in that toxic milieu we called home. Elise, you're going to do great things, and I want to see you get that chance, said firmly with no room for debate. It was a new beginning. Moving away for college literally felt as if I were shedding an old skin. I decided to go into law because I didn't know what else. I knew some of it interested me and the rest felt like this kind of power I'd never gotten a taste for. College was my kingdom, where I could be anything. After I graduated, I went straight west. Instead, I took the apartment in town and began a new career as an attorney. Ava remained at home, having solidified her hold on our parents, from the grandmother who would keep in touch regularly and tell often stories of how it was for Nana. Ava was the great puppet master, and of course they were going to dance on her strings. One of the times Grandma called, she said in a tone that combined bemusement with chagrin, it's like watching a queen and her court. I didn't speak to Mom and Dad much. We spoke very seldom and mostly at their request when they wished to inform me of Ava's birthday or wish her congratulations. Mom said, and don't forget it's your sister's 20th birthday next week, latching on to hope that this common thread might give her more daughters. My birthday would come and go without a second thought from them, something that hurt less with each passing year. One evening, looking out from my balcony as the sunset spread over the serene sprawl of city below me, I decided it was time to truly let go. I needed to let go of some shasterisk tea, the anger, meanness, and comparisons to Ava. I could never undo the history, but I did have control over how much it had on my tomorrow. I had built up an average, decent life, working out slugging the neighbor in a parallel profession, going for happy hours every once in a while with co-workers and catnapping around love of mystery novels over quiet weekends. That is, until the day Nathan strolled into my office. Nathan was a new patient, one of my colleagues' patients that they figured I would be great for. He'd gotten himself into some sticky business dispute, not the first of those I expect to deal with. Nathan wasn't your regular kind of client, though, not from the moment he walked in. He was just so charming and cool in an effortless way. Nathan was sitting in the chair across from my desk, flashing a perfect smile as he said, so you're her, the miracle worker I've been hearing about. I laughed, doing my best to show off and play it cool. Miracles, well, I'll do my best to sort this out for you. The case proved to be more than I had bargained for and involved a hurricane of legal maneuvers and late-night conferences. Because he was more hands-on than most clients who only care about the bottom line, our meetings were always grueling and lasted for ages. His break came one night as we were walking out of the office after a brutal session. Hey, Elise, did you eat? I'm famished and take you out to dinner for keeping your late. That nearby Italian restaurant is all right. What do you say? It made me pause for a minute, which is not something that most people would think of about anything personal in my life. Sure, why not? But for the record, this is just a thank you dinner, right? Strictly professional, he agreed, only with a glint in his eye that said both of us were very much aware the tension existed on my side as well. Dinner was a revelation. Nathan, who was irreverent and insightful when the stacks of legal paper were off his desk, regaled us with stories about world travels and business escapades. I realized I was sharing more of my personal life than ever with someone so new to me. Back on the street, the cool evening felt like a gust of clarity. Thanks for dinner, Nathan. That was refreshing to leave the office, I replied, confessing it more than I wanted. Glad you enjoyed it. Elise, if by some miracle we both make it out of this in one piece, I was planning on asking you if maybe you wanted to hang out again. No papers, no arguments, just you id. It was a somewhat shocking thing for him to say, but I actually really liked the thought. That would be nice, I answered, shocked by how prepared I was to jump head first into whatever mess this seemed like it might be. The weeks blurred together after that, 
an endless parade of arguments in court and dinners at Nathan's. It was a professional triumph, but one that might also have been about us. We rejoiced with drinks in hand, and then Nathan reached across the table to hold my hand. He raised his glass at me, gunners and beautiful lawyers winning men's cases, cheers to being successful in court as well as out of the courtroom, all eyes on marriage with mine. I teased, careful counselor, it could be too much love that you will serve to gain charges of charm overload. And that warm and genuine laugh, a great way to close this short celebration of ours. We only cater to have a professional assistant relationship, which escalate into personal relations shortly after. We shared the same story at everything coming together for a full year since Nathan had taken me out on our first date. That was why when he popped the question it wasn't this really exciting moment that swept me off my feet, but rather a realization and acknowledgement of someone who got me. I said absolutely and no delay was for us. Anxious and numb, I phoned my mother and father. I suppose part of me wished that this might close the divide between us, one which had stretched further apart over time. So I went over to talk about the wedding plans and their response was just distant at best. The moment I walked into their house, the tension hit me. My mom and dad congratulated me, but their words sounded empty. There was no denying that they still believed in the very old rule of Ava, going first anyway, not because you're supposed to, just because she neared herself beside them so long. Ava exposed her sweet side, however, during the visit, she smiled, was sweet, and then threw her offer down like a saint helping hand. Let me take care of your wedding for you, Eliza. It will be how I take action to show you that I do want things to work out between us. Although we were surprised, even before either of us could refuse it was my mother who took the lead and encouraged me to welcome her in our home. Elise Ava is doing the best she can. With the switch in her voice, my mom emphasized that this request was not optional. It would mean so much to let your mother do something for once. Feeling trapped, I reluctantly caved. Ava started to process, at least that's what she claimed. Whenever I inquired, she told me that everything was fine. You just focus on your job. Over the phone, she would chirp. I got this. But so assured was she that I never thought to look it up myself. When the date was drawing near, a hunch tugged at me to get involved in making arrangements for myself. All I got was the supposed schedule from a phone call to their offices. Hello, we have a reservation for the room, but not much else. I felt disheartened as I called the florist, the caterer, and even my decorator. It was the same story. Iva had reached out and then nothing. No follow-ups, no bookings and payments. I was angry and felt betrayed, but this wasn't about to ruin my big day. And I called her because I needed to hear another one of Sua's grand mentiras. Hey, Iva, just wanted to touch base. Everything going good? Oh, absolutely. Elise, it's gonna be G-O-R-G-E-O-S. Oh, try to keep your chin up, she said over the phone with muted cheer. I slammed down the phone and called Leela, a friend who is also a professional wedding planner. I told her about Iva dropping the ball, no, throwing it at Miss Hilarity, and that all I had to show for my wedding in two weeks was a room booked. Leela was horrified but responded, Elise, I'm on it. Consider it done. We will do it, she said, with a resolve that was both comforting and strengthening. The wedding day was a very beautiful, muted affair, as I believe all weddings will be this year. The ambience was perfect, the atmosphere resonated with music, and our guests seemed to enjoy reveling in it. It was perfect, but one part of me was on a blind, especially when I saw Ava stood in the corner with Scowl watching us all to happen happily. Around halfway through the reception, my mother made her way up to the microphone where her voice would echo throughout that half-filled hall. And now, ladies and gentlemen, a special thank you to Ava for holding this amazing event together. You should be very thankful to your sister, Elise. The applause filled the room and Ava grinned modestly. 
A rush of fury coursed through me at the ball blind, my fists bunched into balls beneath the table. Not today, I just couldn't let this go. I stood up and cut through the applause with a tone of command. No, I actually need to explain myself. There were no facts, just me and the room went still. Ava was not behind any of this. If Susan Anderson had her way, she would have ruined the entire fucking wedding. There was silence in the room after my proclamation. Fury raged across my parents' faces. Ava looked shocked, her mask falling. How dare you say that? My mother exhaled, her voice piercing. It's your wedding day and you're giving a bad name to your own sister. I mean, two weeks before today, nothing was ready. No flowers, no cake, no decorations. You did none of the things you promised. I went on, it glared against all that festivity like black ice. Ava seized her opportunity and let out a great theatrical wail. See what I mean? She's hated me forever, always tried to make me look foolish, she sobbed. Guests taken aback by the suddenness of it all, but most shaking their heads and looking at me with disapproval, muttered amongst themselves. Their sympathy appeared to lie with Ava, who was so good at playing the helpless pawn. If it were true, then you could not charge me with slander, I said as the rest of his room whispered between themselves. Then things go haywire, fast. Thien with dram in her voic Ava shrill crewing went out of he hall. The mood turned sour and instead of celebrating we all witnessed a family drama. The repercussions over the next few weeks were far more brutal than I could have ever expected. Ava just disappeared and left a note that made it clear to me she thought I was responsible. Telling me it has always been bad to her that I am the only wrong thing in this life. That note made everyone turn on me, including lifelong friends. Both of them believed every word and thought I had something to do with her running away. Even my grandmother, the one person who had always been able to read Ava like a book up until that point, went cold. One day she sliced me worse than a knife stab's flesh when saying, I can't believe you would drive her to this. That she had vowed to break off all connection with me, driven maybe by the rising tide of pressure and Ava dramatic notation and people slowly drifted away from me and my isolation continued to deepen. Friends and family took Ava's side, which left me to treed the ugly waters of being shunned by those I adored. The marriage I started with Nathan should have been a joyous one, but these events darkened the shadow over our new life. From the day we were married, Nathan was gone more and more each month, with business trips building up like my unread books on the nightstand. Our text exchanges eventually became nothing more than perfunctory check-ins, and the easy communication that we once had was suffocated under a stream of pallid updates. On a cold night, while I piled through the mail bills and receipts, one special tiny slip jumped out at me. He glanced at the receipt on top, a $2,000 bill from a high-end women's boutique. Confusion washed over me. It was cowflocked had already peaking, and my birthday went by without any presents. Our anniversary wouldn't be for months. I didn't confront Nathan. I chose a path different than either, one that felt too invasive yet also so necessary. I hired a private detective. Carl, the detective, was a close-mouthed fellow who listened to my tale with a few grunts of his own. I had intended to say, let me check it out for you but do keep in mind that what I may dig up is not going to be pretty, he asked, his voice gravelly. Yes, I have to find out, as determinedly said my stronger self. Carl called two weeks after that. His voice was even as he said, I have the results. I had not spoken to my grandma in a while, especially after the Ava fiasco where our family was shattered. Grandma was frail, health failing fast, but with a sharp mind, a master of the intricate familial psychology. So I called on her, this friend of mine, the photos, which represented Nathan's ultimate betrayal of us both, weighing as heavily in my large channel bag. When I came, she smiled weakly. The lines of pain around her eyes were so deep. 
Elise, I have missed you, she rasped out in a hoarse whisper. I know, Grandma. Sorry, I said, as I sat on the other side of her tiny frame. This it's between us had spaced out, filled with unspoken words and simmering air. And I paused for a moment before taking the photos and wiping them across the table to her. She peered at all of us, expression indecipherable. She thought about it for a long time before she finally looked up at me, sad, compassionate eyes. Elise, she gasped, taking my hand which trembled in hers. Your sister had us all so completely fooled, didn't she? Even me. Her words were soothing and lashing at the same time. Yes, she did, and I think Nathan has too. I swerved into my grandmother and her tiny body made of brittle bones held me tightly. I'm so sorry, my dear, I should have listened, should have seen. The ensuing dialogue was part tearful and part humorous. Old wounds inscribed upon her heart while mindfully reaching for each of his. A month later, Grandpa passed away. Grandma's will was to be read at our family attorney's office, which was a day I dreaded. The room was buzzing with the same small talk that usually began family events, relatives exchanging minor gossip and polite lies. My heart was beating out of my chest, not just from the coming revelations in the will, but also from how much tension I could feel in that room. Nathan, my husband, was seated next to me as well with far less concern for what he would hear other than out of strict necessity. Suddenly the door opened and much to everyone's surprise, Iva entered. She looked changed and the look was harder, more studied, as her smirking entrance clearly implied she knew the exact effect that would have on all of us. She turned, my parents flew to her out of an explosion from the expected at instant gratitude. Oh, Ava, you're back, my mom gasped, hugging her tightly. Mom, Daddy, Ava cooed her voice silky as she hugged them back, but I could feel the way that those hues drifted room to us and Nathan were shining with victory. Unabashed, she made her way over to him and leaned in for a possessive kiss. Not looking at surprise, Nathan gave back with equal intensity. The silence that followed was deafening. Stepping back, Ava pivoted to the room with her smile ablade. I unearthed a method to disappear, was her conclusion, which she polished off with so much clamor that it staggered many. Elise had driven me off, so Grandma would think everything was going to go directly to her little darling. It was a bombshell which caused something of an audible gasp to ripple around the room. My parents glanced at Iva, and then me, their brows knitting with confusion. And finally, the lawyer, Mr. Hartley, coughed before speaking again. It really was time to concentrate on what needed doing next. If I may continue, he said, and then read the will. Nobody suspected Grandma was dead, least of all Iva or Nathan who heard the best part, that she'd left everything to me. The smirk slid off of her face and shock took its place on Iva's features. This cannot be true, she whispered. Check it again. Here, Mr. Hartley adjusted his spectacles even more in a professional way to hide the outrage he surely must have felt building up inside of him minutely penalized if occasions as to como peen between an acknowledgment that this is how things work and cries of H.U. 8. The will is quite clear, and she made her last edits just a little while ago when your grandmother sat up and took notice of the December 2012 doomsday prophecies. I got up and spoke in a calm voice to the room. I found out about their cheating months ago. Ava has not been hiding from us. She lived in the city where Nathan frequently went away on business, pulled the photos and evidence out from his folder, placing them on the table for all to see. You tried to Shanghai Grandma and betrayed me, Nathan. I felt no ting of pain when my voice gave this out. Nathan got to his feet and looked around he was trapped. Elise, let's discuss this. Nothing to talk about. I clipped away. I want a divorce and I will certainly seek compensation for this betrayal. Elise, Ava tried to explain and stop her. We're family. Surely we can. Family. I cut in, speaking bitterly. 
You've foregone the right to even call yourself a that when ruined it by your refusal and deceptions with all of us for personal gain. Once they had the whole story, my parents gazed back and forth between us with their mouths hanging slightly open. Get a decent lawyer, I told Ava, leaving all the sneer to my tone. Then I turned to Nathan and said, and so will you. Stepping out of the lawyer's office, I felt shed a lot of pounds for months gone by. The road will be rough, no questions. Hab, but for the first time in a long while I held my life with iron grip. So, after all that, I did what any self-respecting lawyer and scorned woman would do. I had my marriage dissolved to Nathan, and a suit filed against both he and Ava for emotional turmoil of their lies. It's a simple open and shut case that assists by the detective who found his motives in her hands. The judge granted me some big bucks of moral damages, not enough for the betrayal I went through. As the last gable sounded and it all became officially final, my marriage, now also a lawsuit of sorts, there was both relief that we had arrived at this inevitable point, but emptiness as well. After the divorce and lawsuit, I severed contact with Nathan and Ava. I thought back to how even my own parents turned on me yet again, falling for her side of the story and thinking that they could make this all okay just by simply pretending these were mistakes and not manipulations. This was next to recovering from the initial betrayal, a subsequent kick half as hard, but that made certain our paths had veered off permanently. Friends and other family members had been supportive, sharing ways in which Iva has shown them her true colors as well as the lengths she would go to for deceit. That almost makes me happy that not everyone was taken in. That same evening as I placed some of Grandma's ancient text on the living room shelf, a knock at the door. When it opened, Uncle Mike stood there, the only person who never turned their back on me, even when I deserved every lonely moment. Just calling to see how you are, Elise, he said, looking around at my modifications of the house. Thanks, Uncle Mike. Come in. So we then moved into the living room, and I invited him to come down there. Glancing around, he nodded his head. You have made something with the place. This is how she probably would have wanted it. Back to your grandma who was full of life. That made me smile and feel a warmth in my chest and it's been a bit therapeutic, honestly. You live here and you keep up the house? Helps me heal a little. My shoulder received a comforting pat from Uncle Mike. Elise, how would she feel about you? Here and for yourself. That was all she ever wanted for you. Uncle Mike left that evening, so I stood at the front door watching him drive off as the sun was going down and then the horizon burst with colors, a harsh reminder that after all those storms life still had beauty to offer. I had the house to keep me grounded, and I felt prepared for whatever would befall, taking with me the strength that Grandma passed on.